It's time for my list of the very worst of the worst comic books of 2021. We've got character assassination after character assassination. We've got multiple events that never, ever fulfilled any type of promise. They were as bad as we ever anticipated they could have been. We've got monologues who will not believe when I show up to you. We've got hipster doofuses coming in left and right, doing everything they can to kill aspirational heroes in the DC and Marvel Comics universe. Hell, we've got one comic book that was so poorly written, they actually did the exact same ending in two different comic books. It's unbelievable. We definitely had some very high highs in 2021, but we had the lowest of lows, and I'm going to be running through this. And then later today, I will have my top 10 comic issues of the year I think you're going to want to be looking out for that. Once you get a load of some of these terrible, terrible comic books, the first one is personal. Exo Man of War, Eric Adasia, is my favorite comic book superhero. He has not been treated very well since Matt Kidd left the character several years ago. They decided to relaunch with Dennis Hopeless Hallam. I was skeptical at first, but now that I've read it, I'm downright embarrassed to be an Exo Man of War fan. I don't know what Hopeless Hallam's thinking. Apparently, he does not understand the simplicity of Eric Adasia. He's literally a Visigoth warrior with an alien Iron Man suit. You can do a lot of really cool things with that, but his motivations and his mindset are as clear as day. They have been since the introduction of the character, but somehow Dennis Hopeless Hallam thinks that he's some type of hipster doofus that lives in a garage in Canada. You can't make this stuff up. If you want to say the best of Exo Man Award, do not look at the current series. It is so rancid. It is so putrid. I cannot even tell you how terrible this thing is. It is definitely one of the worst comic series of 2021. And if you're a fan of the character like I am, I think you'll be just as upset with the current take as I am. James Tynan is taking the money and running now that this Batman series is over. I imagine he wanted to end it on a bang. Unfortunately, that is not what happened. They decided to do a line-wide crossover event, including Nightwing, Catwoman, Batgirl, everything in the DC Comics Batman universe was included in this in Batman Fear State. And what an enormous cluster this thing ended up being. You could tell that DC editorial are stretched so thin that they are not capable of managing and handling an event of this scale properly anymore. We actually got two endings the same exact week, but they were completely different in the two, two different comic books. There was no cohesion between the line. There were characters going after things in one comic, but in another comic, they were going after a completely different mission. It's offensive that it was the third time we saw the exact same event. City of Bane, Joker War, Fear State, essentially the same story over and over. Plus, we also got Future State, which was kind of like this too. But the fact that it was executed so poorly is just, it's offensive to me as a comic book reader, and James Tynan should not be very proud of himself. In fact, I say he should send the checks back to DC Comics because he didn't earn them with that event. Vita Ayala might be the least skilled comic book writer in the industry that somehow continuously gets work at DC and Marvel, even less skilled than Tim Seeley, the Mendoza line, as I like to call him. Children of the Atom is the perfect example of everything wrong with Vita Ayala's writing crap she has no story crap that's a really big issue in the very first issue and the second issue of children of the atom you get the exact same scene and the conclusion to essentially the exact same story they actually charge people to read the exact same comic book in back-to-back -back months and children of the atom is packed to the brim with all of the terrible writing tropes you would expect from a vi Ayala comic book if you've read one vi Ayala comic series you've read them all because they literally cannot help themselves from doing the same thing over and over and over. They've literally Tom King themselves at this point. Speaking of Tom King, the Adonis of assassination, character assassination that is, this year he had some doozies out there. We just saw what he did to Guy Gardner. He turned Adam Strange into a, a war criminal that was essentially uh, murdering people left and right. He actually had a self-insert character in Rorschach that murdered a conservative presidential candidate. But I say the character assassination that takes the cake it was actually in Strange Adventures number six, not Adam Strange, but Mr. Terrific. The conversation with Alana Strange where he reveals that he was relieved when his pregnant wife, an unborn child, died in a car accident because he was not ready to be a father is one of the most sickening things I've ever seen anyone do to a superhero. Not only does it fly right in the face of Mr. Terrific's history, established lore with the character. We don't get to see Mr. Terrific all that often. When you finally get to see him in a major comic book from a major comic writer that Tom King's supposed to be, what does he do? He takes the opportunity 
to run that character into the ground and destroy him. Tom King can only destroy. He can no longer build. And that's something that you're going to find through a lot of the comic book writers on this list. There's only one other indie comic book besides Exo Man of War on this list, and that is Image Comics' Mother of Madness, also known as Mom Number One. This is the worst introduction to a comic book I've ever seen. Amelia Clark was clearly inspired by Brian Michael Bendis, but decided he didn't go far enough with the opening page word vomit. This is not an introduction to come in and read a story. This is an introduction to close the comic book, take it outside, and burn it. I will be surprised if a vast majority of comic readers that bought this issue were able to get past the first page. If you didn't, you saved yourself a lot of pain and a lot of terrible comic book writing. It's full of stupid feminist tropes, character traits that you would not believe. She's a prostitute chemical biologists, just the dumbest list of character traits you could ever put on one person that would never absolutely exist. Mother of Madness, I had no expectations coming in, and it still subverted them. It is so bad. If it weren't such an unimportant comic book, it probably would have taken number one. It was open season on aspirational heroes this year, one of them being Superman, the other one being Captain America. I'll talk about Superman first. Superman Red and Blue number one was supposed to be putting your best foot forward. This is the best that this anthology is. If you want to know what Superman Red and Blue is going to be about, you come in and read number one. And that very first story by John Ridley tells you everything that you ever needed to know about what the purpose of Superman Red and Blue was. It was to tear the character down, to disparage him, to make Superman less heroic. And probably in the mind of John Ridley, this humanizes the character by depowering Superman, putting him into a prisoner camp and having him raped repeatedly. The insinuation of this is awful. I don't know why DC Comics and their editorial staff would have ever allowed this. You're literally paid as the Superman group editor to protect the character and the value that that character has. Why you would let John Ridley come onto the character after what he had to say about Superman using Black Lightning in the other history of the DC Universe and let him write a story. This repugnant and sickening is beyond me, but that's all you need to know about DC Comics in 2021. Not to be outdone was Marvel Comics, specifically Christopher Can't Write Well and the United States of Captain America. Some would say this is the funeral of Captain America. I say no. This is the funeral of America, basically saying that the American dream never existed. This is a foundational piece of Steve Rogers' Captain America. And to say that he now realizes that it was always a lie, that it never existed, essentially destroys the 80-year history of Captain America. We see it from DC. We see it from Marvel. Why their editors let these writers do this, these hacks come in on these characters that are so iconic and so valuable outside of this medium and just trash them because they have a political agenda or they have an ideological slant that doesn't uh, align with the character. If you don't like America, don't write Captain America. If you don't like truth, justice in the American way, don't write Superman. It's not that hard. No writer is entitled to have their turn on Captain America. He's not the neighborhood bike. Not everybody gets a ride. It's so frustrating that DC and Marvel continuously do this, specifically with any straight white male hero. It's been happening left and right. We've seen tons of, of race swaps, gender swaps, sexuality swaps, and we've seen full-blown character assassination see from Christopher Kent Wright well in the United States of Captain America number one. DC's future state ended up being better than I could have anticipated. It was slightly not okay. There were a couple of good stories in there. In fact, one that I included in my best comic stories of the year. But there was one story a DC future state that was worse than I could have ever imagined. It was Future State The Flash. As I understand it, Brandon Vietti is a well-skilled screenwriter and has done very high-level work in the animated world. As far as I know, this is his first foray into DC Comics, and what he does to Wally West in this story is repugnant, it's sickening. If you love Wally West, after what happened to Heroes in Crisis, to have a story like this happen so soon after, it's just so disappointing, once again, that DC Comics would allow this. Wally West, in the future, becomes essentially a serial killer. He still has the speed force. No one else does. Barry Allen tries to stop him, and he touches him and puts him half a second out of time so that Barry Allen has to watch him for the rest of his life murder people. 
and that's the end of the story. How hopeful is that? Is all lost in the DC Comics universe? I'm not certain, but sometimes it feels that way. And that was only outdone at DC Comics by Tom Taylor's Superman Son of Kal-El number two, one of the very worst takes I've ever seen on the Superman character. At least John Ridley was just doing weird stuff to Superman. Tom Taylor is putting words in the mouth of Clark Kent that should never be there, only in the service of propping up the new Superman, John Kent. Tom Taylor, Tom King, Jason Aaron, Brian Michael Bendis, these creators, these top shelf creators, they only know how to destroy at this point. It's the only arrow in their quiver. They do not know how to build anything up. To see John Kent and Clark Kent sitting there and John Kent chastising his father saying, why didn't you do more? And the words coming out of Clark Kent's mouth are, I never felt like this was my home on earth. I always felt like a stranger, so I didn't want to do too much. Does that sound like Clark Kent to you? Does that sound like the character that Schuster and Siegel created all those years ago? Does that sound like the character that John Byrne rejuvenated with Man of Steel? Does that sound like the character that you read in that wonderful Up, Up, and Away story from Jeff Johns and Kurt Busiek? Does that sound like the character that everyone loved in DC Comics Rebirth under Peter Tomasi, Patrick Gleason, and Dan Jurgens? No, it doesn't because it's not the character. And the fact that Tom Taylor and his hubris, he thinks it's okay to destroy everyone else's work, everyone else's creation, as long as it's in the service of his something that he feels is more important. And in this case, propping John Ken up so he can be a sounding board for his own political motivations. Just disgusting stuff all around. I'm cheating with my number one. I'm doing a twofer, but they are somewhat intrinsically related when we talk about X-Factor number 10, the finale of the series in Hellfire Gala. X-Factor number 10 was the very last issue of Hellfire Gala, which I do believe was the worst event. That, that thing is, is terrible. I actually had someone ask me the other day, they said, what was the purpose of Hellfire Gala? The only reason I can come up for that thing to even exist was for variant covers. I'm pretty sure that's the only reason they did it. And hey, they probably made some money off of that. Otherwise, Hellfire Gala was quite embarrassing. The story was stupid. The revelations did not need to be there. You could tell originally this was going to be a one-shot story in a Jerry Duggan comic book, an absolute cluster, exactly what you would expect from Jordan White being in charge as a group editor of X-Men, and he is one of the card-carrying members, if not the leader of the Legion of Doofuses over at Marvel Comics. But X-Factor 10 stands out for so many reasons. When you can offend the fans of X-Men, when you can offend the fans of X Factor and you can offend the fans of neither that you're actually courting with this comic book, you've done something amazing. Now, I do want to acknowledge it's not all Leah Williams' fault. She certainly went on that podcast and said that story that concludes in X Factor number 10 was supposed to stretch out for another two issues. They made her compact it in there so they could get into this stupid Trial of Magneto story. But the failings in X Factor 10 go beyond terrible storycraft. They go beyond incompetence and they reach another plane of existence called ignorance i don't know what leah williams and the editorial staff led by legion doofus jordan white were thinking compacting all this into one store when they had not worked the story out and they weren't going to be able to tell it competently and just deciding to do it anyway you pissed everybody off you had literally the people that leah williams was courting with this comic book who aren't fans of x-men who aren't fans of x-factor People that had never bought the comic book but had read it were calling for her, her to be fired. That's how offended you are. When you've offended people that didn't pay for your product but consumed it anyway, and then they start calling for your firing, you've done something amazing. Leah Williams, a slow clap for you, a slow clap for Jordan White, the Legion of Doofus is at Marvel Comics. You actually came in number one. You outshone the rest of the Hellfire Gala, which absolutely sucked because X-Factor number 10 is bad in so many ways. It's truly remarkable what you were able to accomplish with this comic book. You literally pissed everybody off. And that's something that you can be proud of because not everyone gets to accomplish that in their career. Those are my 10 worst comics of the year 2021. There's some absolute stinkers in there. I hope you enjoyed the list. Let me know what you thought was the worst comic issue, the worst comic story, the worst comic series maybe the worst character assassination. If I didn't cover it here, put it in the comment section. I want to have a conversation with you guys. Hey, if you're looking for more disappointment, I had a list yesterday of my biggest disappointments in the comic book industry 2021. There's only six of them. It's not Ted, 
But I think you'll like this one. And uh, these are more overarching, bigger issues. But this is a fun video as well.